Hey everyone, welcome aboard. Before we start, I wanna say hello to members of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking, our skeptical neighbors to the North who are joining us online today. Welcome everyone to the monthly lecture series presented by the National Capital Area Skeptics, NCAS, also known as NCAS. I'm Scott Snell, currently the NCAS president, speaking to you from my home in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside Washington, DC. NCAS has been hosting monthly public lectures in the DC area since our founding in 1987. For the past several months, we've been live streaming our events on the second Saturday of each month. Have a look at our collection of previous NCAS lectures on our YouTube site. You'll find interesting discussions on topics such as Scientology, how to read a medical study, and how to investigate ghost stories skeptically. I imagine some of you might associate the word skeptic with closed-minded or scoffing at new ideas. Actually, skepticism is asking tough questions and following the evidence wherever it may lead us whether it's where we thought it would or where we would have liked it to or otherwise. We consider claims carefully in terms of evidence and logical consistency. We act as advocates for science and reason, to promote critical thinking and scientific understanding, and to provide an information resource about extraordinary evidence-based claims. Learn more about us at ncas.org and be a part of today's program. Skeptics ask and answer tough questions, so please post your questions and comments anytime in the chat window. We also have a special Zoom event for NCAST members after this YouTube live stream ends. We'll have an online reception with our speaker for a while, and then we'll have social time after he has to leave. NCAST members should check their in-mail inboxes to find the Zoom meeting information at the end of this program. All right, our guest today is Alan Levinovitz, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at James Madison University, where he teaches and researches a wide range of topics, classical Chinese philosophy, religion and science, even toy design. Today I'll be discussing his book. It's currently available in hardcover, ebook, audio format, soon to be a paperback, and cited on the bookshelf of none other than Dr. Fauci. The book is Natural, How Faith in Nature's Goodness Leads to Harmful Fads on Just Laws and Flawed Science. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from Charlottesville, Virginia, Alan Levinovitz. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk about the book with you and all of the, all of the many issues that, uh, that are associated with nature and how people feel about naturalness. Yes, thanks for being here today. Uh, when I, um, I, by the way, I enjoyed your book and I've enjoyed your interviews on the web and uh, I'm thinking of, of how this will fit in with those other interviews uh, where we might make a unique pathway into your, your ideas uh, and, and clarify some aspects. So looking at the title, you have How Faith in Nature's Goodness. So I, I see faith and that nature and goodness are one in the same in, in many minds. Would you expand on that? Absolutely. One of the key insights of the book is that people think of nature as a source of norms and they make it a foundational source of norms. So nature becomes something like a secular standing for God. And instead of looking to God for the unchanging norms that should govern our behavior and determine how we organize society or figure out our sexuality or even what to eat or what to buy in the store, people instead turn to what is natural as, as what they believe is a secular source of those norms. And yet what I claim in the book is that in fact, to think of nature in that way is to have a kind of faith, not unlike the faith that people have in a more traditional God. That is to say, you have to understand nature as perfectly good and original and therefore originating all of the ethical norms that we have um, governing us. So it is an explicitly 
you know, there's an explicit parallel to religion. And, and, and that's what the book tries to get across, that to believe in natural goodness is in effect to have a kind of religious belief, even if it doesn't appear that way. Mm -hmm. um, so you have in the title nature's goodness, but there's also obviously badness in nature. But that is, is that part of your um, commentary that, um, that badness is not included when it should be? That's that's exactly right. I mean, the, people call this so in, in religious studies the the problem of evil is something that gets brought up, uh, you know, over and over again by theologians and and you know, atheists or agnostics alike. The idea that if you have an omnipotent God, how can there be how can there be bad things in the world? And similarly, what you have when people say that naturalness is good is a whole host of ways that they either ignore the bad things that come from, that, that, that are a part of nature. I, one of the examples I give in, in the chapter on birth is childbirth, which is just a manifestly imperfect natural process um, in animals and humans alike. And yet the response to that, the response to these examples of natural phenomena that are, that are bad, that we can improve through unnatural means like obstetrics and hospitals is that well, it must be it must be bad because we've departed from nature. So there is a sort of circular logic often when people try to justify the idea of nature being perfectly good, which is that whenever you point out bad things about nature, they'll say, well, yes, those bad things exist, but they they only exist because we've departed from nature. And that that brings up another religious feature of the natural goodness perspective, which is that that it echoes the kind of idea of a fall from a perfect Eden. So we can attribute all ills, whether they're social ills or physical ills, to a departure from an original perfect state. And whether that's the Garden of Eden or some kind of hunter-gatherer paradise, the, the narrative arc remains the same. So that's, of course, one of the things I try to do in the book is bring out the, the myriad ways in which what is natural is not necessarily good or can be improved upon by humans and encourage people to, to recognize that complexity rather than deny it. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, natural childbirth, obviously the medical literature is out there to inform, you know, the people um, about the risks of uh, childbirth and yet somehow this hasn't gotten through to everybody. What, what do you think happened? Naturalness is a very powerful idea and it is significant. And this is something also, you know, when I went into this book and I've talked about this in various interviews and I talk about it in the book as well, because I think it's important. When I went into this book, I, I thought I was going to be writing a kind of debunking. This was going to be a sort of Richard Dawkins, but for nature instead of God kind of thing. And I came to change my mind. I realized for one that that nature really is valuable in and of itself, that naturalness really is a valuable thing. I don't think there's a single person watching this that doesn't value nature or the natural world in some way or another, whether it's going on walks, whether it's having houseplants in your home, whatever it happens to be, there is something astonishing about nature. It really is a force that exists beyond and before human beings that, that, ended up issuing in all of the things that we see around us, all of the animals of the world, all of the plants of the world, uh, the solar system, all these things are organized by natural forces. And I use the passive voice advisedly there because I don't, I don't believe that there is a conscious force doing the organizing, but nevertheless, they are organized. We do have organization in the natural world. And that is to use a religious term, a kind of miraculous thing. So to, pin this back or to tie this back to your question about natural birth, I think people really want to participate in nature and naturalness in some form or another. And given that birth is an extraordinarily significant event, I came to understand why people would want to connect with those forces that come from beyond before human beings, just as nature is the originating force for everything we see, you know, so to the person giving birth or the process of childbirth is like a ritual recapitulation of the generation of life. So I, that, that significance is very important to people. 
The problem is in order to justify wanting that significance, which, which I think is fine, I think that's you know, it's perfectly reasonable, they then start to make other claims which are less reasonable, claims like it is better for your health or it is safer or it has always been safe or it's pain-free if you do it the right way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we move from a value among many values to a kind of ur controlling value, and that's where it becomes more. That's where it becomes more religious and and less uh, and more homogenous, right? That, that's when nature turns into God rather than remaining where it ought to be. Mm -hmm. You uh, include stories in your book on the various topics, including natural childbirth, of of how people make choices. Uh, you know what to do. Uh, if it doesn't work out, you know, like having a contingency plan, um, you know, or you, you, you want it to go a certain way, but if you have to, an epidural or, uh, you know, other techniques to uh, manage the situation. Well, it's interesting, you know, the, the epidural, again, the, the, to, to understand, I mean, obviously I'm a religion scholar, so when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I really think it's important to understand life as studded with rituals, eating is a very important ritual, whether we think about it that way or not. Childbirth is a very important ritual. Coming of age is a very important ritual. And we all think about those rituals, you know, Judy Bloom, right? Where are the air guard? It's me, Margaret, right? There's these, there are all these rituals that are often tied to biological processes and transformations um, that really do shape our understanding of the world and influence what we believe and influence our choices of actions. And so as, as I point out to people, there are women who forego epidurals who would not do the same in the dentist's office. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a, there's a big difference. And, and part of that difference, I think was fairly obvious, but I, it's worth pointing out is that getting your teeth worked on isn't as sacred a ritual as giving birth to a child. Mm -hmm. And so we think about how we want a childbirth to be in a different, we want to sanctify it. Even if, they, you know, again, I'm using these religious terms advisedly, but I think they're important. We want to sanctify childbirth in a way that we don't want to sanctify getting a root canal. Mm -hmm. And so that, that helps to explain the difference in the choices. Yes. Um, so in a way, uh, the title uh, says, uh, you know, uh, nature's goodness, maybe nature's holiness, because there is goodness and badness in nature. And, and people do recognize that, for instance, one of our participants mentioned about uh, venomous snakes, obviously a part of uh, nature that's very famous. So um, we, we wouldn't, uh, you know, have a lot of people out there that think all nature is good, that they would have a complete equation of nature equals goodness. It, uh, That's right. It's the it's the equation, and, and you know, the, you know, to give it, to take the example of snakes. I mean, this is a bit extreme, but I think what someone who believes in nature's goodness would say is they would say, well, the only reason we have trouble with snakes is because we are straying outside of our natural habitat or mm -hmm. something like that. So, for the person who believes that nature is purely good or holy, that's exactly right. It, all problems are a function of departing from the natural order. Mm -hmm. of things. And this idea, you know, natural doesn't just mean plants and, you know, the forces of nature as we understand them. Natural also has a lot of other meanings. And I talk about this in the book. When people say natural, they often mean spontaneous. They mean free or unengineered. The opposite of natural is artificial, which has artifice built into it or art, the idea that something was willed by a human being rather than being spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And, and so in those ways too, the word natural gets beyond our traditional understanding of it in the context of say natural birth or natural medicine. And it starts to mean things like natural markets, for example, what, by which people don't mean, you know, d markets designed by mother nature. What they mean is markets that emerge spontaneously or markets that have not been engineered, that are not artificial. Mm -hmm. And the same sort of commitment to the holiness of spontaneity can be seen in, in economic theory, just as it is seen in the people who are looking at it in the context of medicine or food. Mm -hmm. 
um, you you gave a rebuttal of the venomous snake argument uh, that this type of person would make of we are encroaching on their territory, therefore we're having encounters with nature in an unfortunate way. What if I were to offer a different example that I think might be impossible to rebut, but I, you're, you're the expert on this, and that would be a planetary impact. So an asteroid is on course for Earth and it's devastating and it's definitely a natural phenomenon and there's no way humanity has influenced that uh, physical encounter, what, what would that venomous snake skeptic or whatever, um, closed-minded person, I guess, say, do you think, in rebuttal to that type of natural badness? I, I, you know, I mean, it's hard for me to speak to the hypothetical nature worshiper, but I think, I think what I would say is that to bring up those kinds of arguments, ultimately, is to misunderstand why people care about nature to begin with. Uh, in other words, people will make these sorts of claims. They will say, well, it's because we got out of our natural habitat or something like that. But ultimately that's a, I believe at least, that's a defense mechanism for a cognitive heuristic that they didn't develop in that way to begin with. So this is not a position that people have come to hold because they've looked at all the evidence and thought very carefully about it and decided that the most rational way to approach childbirth or you know, economic markets or whatever it happens to be is, is through naturalness. That's not how people got there. The, <laughs> the, the reason people get to this place and the reason it's important to people, I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but one is that we need, we need quick and easy cognitive heuristics for making decisions in our lives. You walk mm -hmm. into the store and you need to know what to buy. And you can't, you know, you can't engage, you can't micromanage your own decision making with every single product that you buy. And so it's easier to have a heuristic like what's natural is good. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that people, people like what's natural because of this cosmic significance. It's just, it's, it's, it's an extraordinarily powerful and meaning making idea that brings joy and certainty and gives people a sense of control and agency. And so the, the, the example of the asteroid destroying life on earth is, I think it's sort of like and Alec, it's sort of like saying to the football player who thanks God after the game, well, do you really think God cares about your football game? I, I think it's, a, it's kind of a category. It's a, mis, it's a misunderstanding of what the football player is doing when they thank God or when the person prays for healing. And you say, well, what about all the people that aren't getting cured by prayer? You know, yes, people are praying and they do, they do believe in a sense that, that prayer is causal, causally efficacious. But it's also, it's more of a ritual claim uh, of connection to a divine being that cares. Um, and, and that's that, that's not, that's something I also come to understand. Uh, there's room in life for those sorts of rituals and relationships. It's just important not to let them lead to bad decision-making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see your book is offering not just evidence for what you're describing here now, but also, um, in terms of what to, what would be better, in other words, the nuance that you want people to have on these matters. Um, yeah, I'd like people. I'd like people to be able to embrace uncertainty, and I would like people to be able to understand. And this is not just in the context of what's natural. That there's not going to be any heuristic that is free of costs and is only benefits and. We'd like to believe that. I see this all the time with food. So for natural food enthusiasts, for example, you will rarely find someone who thinks natural food is better for your health, but worse for the environment. Or conversely, someone who thinks that natural food is better for the environment, but worse for your health. It is always good in all possible ways. Natural food will be best for your health. It will be best for the local economy. It'll be best for the global economy. It'll be best for whatever, whatever it is, natural will be better. And that's, you know, if you think about it from, it's very unlikely. Why would, why would this one was one form of food, unless it's designed by God, why would this one way of eating or why would this one kind of food be best in all possible ways? Mm -hmm. And 
that's something that I want people to be able to recognize and back away from a little bit because we have a lot of very complicated problems that we are facing collectively in the 21st century and addressing them is going to require a clear-eyed assessment of costs and benefits, even of one's preferred eating pattern or whatever it happens to be. And the, the tendency to default to homogenizing heuristics that flatten everything is, you know, it's tempting, but it's ultimately not a good description of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our participants, uh, Gabe Goldberg in Falls Church, Virginia, um, wants to ask a sort of a big picture question here. Um, humans are part of nature. So aren't human inventions and innovations natural? You know, why have you separated them? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, that's a great question. I really appreciate that. So there's, I give two answers to that. One is it, to the extent that the book is just describing uh, a phenomenon that has, that, that, that involves history and people. I, I want to understand why other people think in this way, whether or not the distinction is metaphysically accurate or something, you know, perhaps everything is natural. On the other hand, after working on this book for a long time and researching naturalness, I don't think it's absurd to claim that some things are more natural than others. So if we take nature, and I'll go back to my discussion of the idea of nature as what's natural is spontaneous rather than willed by human beings or designed by human beings. If you take natural to mean that which is unwilled by humans, and you take unnatural to mean that which is willed by humans, it actually, you, you get a pretty good division of the world. I mean, it's a scale, right? So things aren't purely natural or unnatural, but you know, before humans existed, everything was natural. And then when humans came out of the scene, who knows when that was, a little bit blurry, um, they started willing things and those things were less natural. And now we are at a point where I think it's safe to say that New York City is less natural than Yellowstone Park. And without that distinction, Ideas, for example, like conservation make no sense. What is, it, what is it that we are trying to save when we save the environment? Or what is it that we are trying to save when we are trying to preserve nature? If everything's nature, then there's nothing to conserve. It doesn't matter, right? Um, then, then you might as well, then, then, a, then someone who's trying to save a city block in New York City is just as much a nature conservationist as someone who is trying to stop you know, a marshland from being developed. So I do think, I do believe that it's a, a reasonable and clear way of talking to say that what is natural is what is not willed by humans. What is unnatural is what is willed by human beings. Those things exist on a spectrum, but they, they signify in different ways, which is why I, I feel differently about plants that are, are natural as opposed to plants that are plastic. Now, in response, someone, you know, it's very important, you know, well, of course these plants are bred by, you know, they're often they're, they're made by, they're created by human beings, but certainly on the scale of willed by humans versus unwilled by humans, the, the organic plant is more like, more unwilled by humans than the plastic plant. And that's, you know, I think that's actually a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a very intuitive way of talking about reality. <laughs> Um, you mentioned briefly about, uh, you know, the emergence of humanity, uh, our uh, distant ancestors and modern efforts to kind of recapture uh, the positive aspects of that paleo diet, um, uh, other things along that line. The one thing that occurred to me that I didn't see mentioned in your book was how do they accept that um, our ancestors didn't cook things um, you know, that there was, uh, you know, eating raw uh, vegetables and uh, nuts and uh, meat. Um, and then and then cooking came along later as an invention. Um, yeah. The, so these paleo, the paleo, the paleo diet, which is sort of, you know, this, this thing you see a lot. And there's also there's sort of there's easy mockeries of the paleo diet um, and debunkings of the paleo diet or paleo lifestyle in general. You see a lot of people saying, oh, if you want to know how to parent, you got to parent like a hunter gatherer, right? This is why, you know, I went to Peru to find out how hunter gatherers were parenting after reading one of these articles. Uh, mm -hmm. And it turns out, you know, they're also interested in having their kids learn how to read because they're human beings like anyone else. Um, and they are interested in salt for flavoring their food. The, there is a naive version 
of the the appeal to hunter gatherer <laughs> lifestyles, which says it was all better in the past, and there was this one moment in time. You know, they don't think of they don't think of nature as a process, but as a kind of static place in the past, and that that's an unreasonable way to think about what it is to be a hunter gatherer. And part, you know, the hunter gatherers lived in lots of different areas of the world. Um, they, like you said, you know, what do we? It's sort of an arbitrary point in time. To, to pick something and say, okay, well, hunter gatherers, they did cook, but they didn't have agriculture. They had agriculture, but it was, uh, you know, forest, it was silviculture, right? We're gonna count, we're gonna allow that, we're not allow other things. That approach is, it seems to me misguided. That said, I spoke with enough scientists to be convinced that thinking about something that's called the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, which is, is a controversial term, but basically what it means is that all organisms uh, evolved in a context. Um, and that context is often very broad and it's tough to pin down what that context is, but it is, it is reasonable as a hypothesis generating heuristic to say, well, if this organism is having difficulties if if it is if its natural life cycle is being interrupted it's worth considering the hypothesis that perhaps a departure from the environment of evolutionary adaptedness is responsible for those problems so if you've got sea turtles that all of a sudden are laying their eggs at the wrong time of the year it is worth considering as a hypothesis that perhaps the newly installed, you know, the newly installed boardwalk with bright spotlights is confusing them because they evolved in a particular environment with a particular kind of light. Now with humans, it becomes much more complicated, but that base that, you know, we are not sea turtles. And one of our interesting adaptive capabilities is, is, is flexibility. We have adapted to be able to live in a wide variety of contexts and survive on a wide variety of foods. Um, nevertheless, I still think it's reasonable to use departures from the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness as a hypothesis generating heuristic, provided that you already haven't decided in advance that the answer is going to be why, yes, this problem that we have is due to too much technology or too much artificiality. That That's the kind of thing that leads to moral panics over screen time in children that often don't map on to what we're actually seeing in the data. Yeah, it seems to me there's so many experiments, quote unquote, going on, not just in different cultures, but different families, uh, different parts of the United States and so on, that uh, we might later find out that, hey, these people seem to be happier because they do such and such. And yet, personal preference is is clouding the question i you know there's i i live near people who have very different tastes than i do we're all in the same community it, it it's almost um, as if that isn't a solvable problem in terms of trying to figure out uh what's the best environment for homo sapiens for right <laughs> of, of absolutely i mean that that that's something too i try to address in the book which is where inevitably this is another version of the sort of desire for simple cognitive heuristics, we're always engaging in these absurd comparisons, you know, because like, when, when were we, we, when were we happier, you know, now or 500 years ago? Is this, you know, it, it just, it's, it's just, it's a question that's impossible to answer. Which culture was better? Which civilization had it right? Those, I don't think those are very helpful questions. Uh, have more, more helpful questions are things like, you know, people, you know, there's rising rates of diabetes. What can we do about it? Seems to me to be a much better question. Um, you know, eyesight is bad. What should we do about it? And this is actually a great example of, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons that, that everyone's eyesight is bad, though all, all you know, we're, I, both of us are wearing glasses. Um, you know, um, why? Well, because we look at tiny stuff a lot. And in our environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, wh whenever it happened to be, I can tell you one thing I know about it is that we were not doing a lot of reading in that environment. <laughs> And, and so what's, what happened? Well, we got worse vision and we came up with glasses. And you know what? I'm fine with that. I'm, that whole, the departure, the artificial solution in the end, I think it's great. I'm going to keep reading things and my daughter's got glasses and I don't 
I, there's, I don't know, it's fine. I don't regret a thing. I wanted to keep reading her books mm -hmm. or looking at her computer screen. So there's also, the, there's also the fact that even if departure from the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness results in problems like bad vision, that doesn't mean that the benefits of the small symbols that we use to encode information and look at, that the benefits of that aren't, you know, don't outweigh the costs. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy with what we're doing right now. Um, even, even if these do steam up when I'm wearing a mask. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier uh, about diabetes and, and also um, uh, food related uh, connections to this topic. Um, you know, the FDA in the United States here, um, in terms of defining uh, what branding something is natural, you know, a manufacturer tries to sell a food or drug and it's got the on the label natural it, what what's the story on that uh, especially from well, your perspective well it's, it's helpful that it's right next to it can you know it's right next to the kosher symbols so you know that what's going on here is uh it's, it's just kosher for secular it's a secular kosher symbol huh. no i mean I, it's not I, I i joke but it's it is actually true you see all of these symbols clustered in the same place um oh the, the nat well, first of all, so natural is not regulated by the FDA right now. Um, they never settled on a definition. They put out a call for definitions. I read through all of the all of the things citizens submitted comments, and uh, you know, often God featured in those comments. You know, saying so what's natural is what made what was made by God. And there's some very popular celebrity doctors who say things like like that, right? What does it mean for something to be natural? Well, did God make it? You know, God made avocados, but God didn't make you know, guacamole. Or whatever. I don't know what it's, which is sort of again, you want a simple heuristic. Uh, but I understand what people are saying. I understand what people want when they want that on the label. Again, I, I, I went into this very skeptical. And I don't, I don't mean skeptical. I went in this very cynical. That's the word. You know, what kind of person would want to see natural on their, on their label? Only an idiot, right? But that's not true. You look, at the, you look at the world, and here we are, and our artifice is destroying the environment. We've got chemicals polluting rivers. We've got all kinds of disasters happening that it is very reasonable to link to technology. And, and so when people want their food to be natural, what I think they're saying is, A, I don't want to pollute my body in the same way that the ocean is polluted with these plastics or the nanoparticles that I hear about or whatever it happens to be. I don't want that stuff in my body. It's hurting the body of the earth. Surely it would also hurt me. So that's one thing I think people are saying, and it makes a lot of sense. And another thing I think people are saying is that they don't want to hurt the world. So another thing that natural conveys to people on packaging, whether it's true or not, is a different question, is, hey, this thing that you're buying was created in a way that aligns with the natural order. And that means, you know, you're the, the animals that you care about and that you donate to the nature conservancy to save, that, that the thing you're eating isn't hurting them. So, right. so to the extent that those values make sense, I, I get why we want, why people want natural on labels. The problem is that the world is much more complicated than that. And natural on a label does not actually tell you whether the food that you are eating is good for the natural world or for that matter, your own health. Mm -hmm. uh, you've described a situation with the uh, FDA here in the United States. What about other nations though, or the European Union? Have they made an effort to systematically? You know, I don't know, like Natürlich in, in Germany or something like that. I, I, I I don't know if they've regulated. So I'm not, I'm not an expert on the, the regulation of the term natural in Europe. Although I do know that both in the United States and in Europe, the term organic has been regulated. And what actually, you know what, I think, gosh, I, I am, I don't want to say any, I don't want to get it wrong, but in, in England, I believe natural is, is regulated, at mm -hmm. least in advertising and is linked to Part of the definition is traditional, which is very interesting to me because another reason that people believe in natural goodness, whatever, whatever that might mean, is that they see this as, uh, a, a, they see what's natural as something that's time tested. So if nature is a kind of iterating set of systems in which what is good is conserved and what is bad falls by the wayside, if that's what nature is doing, then 
you can think about human culture in some ways as doing the same kind of thing. I actually noticed a lot of similarities between what you would associate with political conservatism on the one hand with culture uh, and and the idea that na nature is good. On the other hand, which you might associate in some context, at least with political, uh, with a liberal political position, although this, that gets a bit complicated. But anyways, all of that is to say that, you know, when England says, hey, something natural, you know, beer is natural, right? If it's been brewed according to traditional methods, what that tells you is that actually what people value when they say natural, what they really mean is it's been around for a while and we know, and we know about it. It's mm -hmm. safe because it's been time tested. So again, another thing I try to do in the book is, is take this word natural and, and disambiguate all of the values that are going into it. So sometimes when people say natural, what they mean is it connects me with those mysterious forces that I love when I'm on a hike. Mm -hmm. And other times what they mean is, I mean, it's been around for a long time, so I know it's safe. Mm -hmm. And other times what they mean is, it happens spontaneously and I like freedom. And so, and, and all of those are reasonable values to have and to care about. And if we can stop saying natural and start saying what we mean, I think that'll also be helpful for people figuring out what it is that they value and why they value it. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the flip side of that uh, where unnatural or synthetic perhaps has a, a negative uh, connotation. You just mentioned that uh, here. And uh, one of our participants suggested uh, instead of on natural, meta natural. I, I have another thought though, crafted. So you mentioned about beer, uh, quite often an advertiser will say this is crafted. And it, it, I think crafted has a positive connotation. What do you think? It does. It certainly gets away from artificial. Again, artifice was not, it's interesting, you know, you trace the history of these words. If you go back, I think I would say like 300 years. Artificial was not the sort of slur that it is today. It was associated with art, which is, I mean, that's a very positive idea, right? That's built into the, built into the term. Now that you're absolutely right, the idea of craft is untainted. I mean, you have it in crafty. Um, <laughs> so, so in that word, you see again, right, manipulated, which is another word that has negative connotations, right? You don't want to be manipulated. That means someone else has control over you or they've directed things in a certain way. Um, so even in that word craft, it's funny that, that you have the, a parallel term that is built out of the sinister implications of, <laughs> of being manipulated or being artificial. But yes, absolutely. When you say craft, it avoids some of those connotations. Again, I think when people hear craft, a part of the reason it avoids the negative connotations is because they think of it as something traditional. If yeah. you say a craft, you know, nobody thinks of computer, I mean, maybe uh, 200 years from now, computer programming will be a craft. But when you say craft, people think woodworking. <laughs> they don't think, um, you know, building, building a computer from scratch or something like that. Yes. Even though, of course, both of them are crafts, <laughs> you know, just, just uh, you know, one is a craft just as much as the other. Mm -hmm. While we're discussing word meanings, isn't it possible that, um, you know, um, the um, natural uh, uses of the word natural have been subjected to the same forces you just described, such as awesome is now a good thing. It didn't used to be, uh, you know, it's, it's sibling is awful and awful is still back in the bad zone and awesome has become a good thing or terrific. That's also a good thing. Wonderful isn't necessarily a good thing, but now it is. Sick or bad is become a good thing in some circles. Um, is it possible that the word natural has also had sort of a um, this, this drift in its meaning uh, and it's not because of a, a sort of a reverence or religiosity? I, forgive me, I, I'm I'm sort of poking at your thesis a bit. I, I hope it doesn't tickle or, or hurt no, in any way. Not at all. I mean, this is, again, the, this is why tracing the history of the words is, is so important. For me, what's the term natural, I mean, what is referred to as nature has changed. So for a time, 
the idea was that you had to perfect human nature or that, or that it was the job of humans to go out and perfect nature. So wilderness was a bad thing. And you went out and what nature was, was something for humans to manipulate and bring to perfection in line with God's plan. In those contexts, the, the, the words aren't as important as what it is I think they are standing in for, the kinds of values that they are standing in for. So at, at all times, so take Chinese, for example, um, the word that is traditionally translated as natural is ziran, which means self-so or so of itself, uh, if, you, if you wanna translate those two characters literally. And that did not necessarily refer to the natural world in the way that we understand it today. It just referred to things that were so of themselves. And that had, you know, there was, there was debate about that, just as there's debate about the relative goodness of naturalness today. And for me, you know, what's most important is to have people reflect on precisely the kinds of changes that you're bringing up to realize that our attitude towards nature has not been constant, that it is often influenced by cultural context, that natural birth, as I discuss in the book, is a privilege. And it is a privilege that is, that is a result of having such unnatural, wonderful health care that we can actually think to ourselves uh, that we can pine for a time when, when, when things were better, right? That's not something that you see happen very often um, in, in less privileged contexts. And so I like, I like that people would look at these terms and trace out their history precisely because it makes simplistic ideas like what's natural is what's good, that much harder to sustain. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you were just discussing uh, some aspects of Chinese philosophy. Um, my understanding is you lived in China also for a time. I wonder what your perception of their myths regarding natural, mm -hmm. if any, uh, might be, especially well, given that they've gone industrial at, at, at just an amazing, I, I would say breathtaking, but it's a pun, forgive me, uh, with their air pollution, uh, that they've gone industrial uh, such, at such a, a pace. Um, how, does that, how would that fit in with their views of natural uh, as goodness, as, uh, as holiness, if in fact that is the case? So I'm, I'm not a, I know much more about ancient China than I do about modern China. So I'm not a sociologist of modern China. So I would hesitate to say anything about contemporary Chinese attitudes towards the natural world. That said, what I, one of the things I was very struck by when I was living in China, of course, things may have changed in the last 20 years. And, you know, China has become much more aware of itself as a polluter. And, you know, there's an international sense of urgency about climate change that is, is, was not around when I was there, you know, near, I mean, it's nearly two decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there were obvious differences that struck me. And when, it, when you go into a park in China, for example, I had, I had grown up thinking that, um, you know, national parks, that sort of thing, you want them to look as natural as possible. So you have these dirt paths that almost blend in with the forest floor. And as, as much as you could keep that sort of illusion, the better it was. Whereas in China, you had stairs often, you know, concrete or stone stairs that were in the middle of national parks. And I realized that there was a different kind of attitude towards the way in which you would construct a place for humans to encounter nature. And that was something even, you know, back then I wasn't researching naturalness, but I still remember thinking to myself, geez, these, you know, this is a place that where, where there's a very different understanding of the ideal relationship between a human and the natural world. They don't have me on a dirt path. This path is paved. Um, these stairs stand out in a way where, a, 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 you know, a, a, a dirt path that tacks back and forth in order to get up a hill would not. Um, so that was something that I, that, that I was really struck by. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing I would say is important to understand that I, that I can speak to contemporary China about is that reverence for the natural world. So in Chinese medicine, especially contemporary Chinese medicine, this is something I am more familiar with. One of the things that has been done ha is, is a kind of marketing of Chinese medicine as natural. Um, this makes sense to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way through today. Um, the, in the exporting of Chinese medicine, the idea that it is aligned with naturalness has been something that's that's been sold to the public. 
again and again and again. And when you hear people who talk about enthusiasm for Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, naturalness is often a part of that. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, you find that Chinese medicine is not very good for animal conservation. So it is, I mean, it is a really helpful thing to think about, which is that even if you do like Chinese medicine and you like the way you, you believe that natural cures are better, there's a cost here, which is that many of the cures that have emerged out of natural medicine come with, a, you know, require killing animals, mm-hmm. uh, often endangered animals. And that, that shows that even a medicine system that is natural, quote unquote, is clearly not aligned with the interests of the natural world as we as we have come to understand them, say, in the world of, of conservation. Mm-hmm. It sounds like there might be some future uh, insights here if you work with, uh, you know, modern so- uh, Chinese uh, sociology uh, experts. Um, you, you, Absolutely. You, it's something yeah. I would it's something I'd really like to see. I, have, I was I was actually in Japan more recently than I was in China. And there, there is, and China is very different, or Japan is very different from uh, China in terms of their own history with, with nature um, and the relationship between Japanese religion and the natural world. But there is a turn internationally, I would say, and again, this is something for sociologists to investigate. There's an international turn towards the idea of natural goodness as it is better when things have not been interfered with by humans. And I think that's a part of that is something I call, well, I don't call it this, I, a term that I borrow from historians of technology, something uh, that they call uh, epistemic opacity. And what they mean by this is that there are some things where that are epistemically transparent in the sense that you can know how they work or at least feel like you know how they work just by looking at them. So this is the sort of back in the day when you had a car, you could pop the hood and all the parts were interchangeable and everyone could fix the car. Now I open up my Prius and I don't know how to deal with it and I can't take it to the local mechanic. It's very specialized or, you know, my, my computer, I have no idea how this works. I can't take apart my iPhone. They're, these are opaque. They are epistemically opaque and epistemic opacity is alienating. It means we are surrounded by things, powerful things that we do not understand that have been designed by humans. And that, and in fact, part of the reason we don't understand them is they've they've been designed by humans. They're very complicated objects that have been designed by humans. And the turn to what's natural, I think internationally, I think is a reaction against epistemic opacity. It is disempowering to be surrounded by things that you don't understand. (laughs) And even if it's true that people you know, don't actually understand how, you know, I don't actually understand how photosynthesis works, uh, you know, in any significant way. Um, It feels like I do. And feeling like you understand how things work is a good feeling. And I think we're going to see more of this turn to natural goodness and valuing of natural things, the more we are surrounded by epistemically opaque objects and systems. Hmm. Uh, in, in a way, we're surrounded by magic um, of, of human creation, you know, new inventions and so on. And yet, if we get on Google, and obviously there's a lot of untrustworthy information there, but instructions about how to fix your car, uh, your Prius, you mentioned, uh, it, I mean, we can get cut through the mystery with a little research potentially, although there are natural mysteries that uh, no human is yet um, solved. Well, with the, well, the magic, it's interesting you bring up magic. I, you know, uh, the magic, and I think, what is it? There was some, some science fiction author said something like, I, I, I believe, you know, any, sufficient, any, any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic or something. Arthur C. Um, Clark, yes. Yeah, so I think, I think uh, all respect to Clark, he doesn't understand magic very well because magic was not actually mysterious at all. Magic was a very straightforward set of steps for manipulating the natural world or manipulating the spirits that were out there and getting the results that you wanted. There were formulas that you undertook. You get a, there was, you know, magic was actually very intuitive. You, you want to hurt this person, you get a doll that looks like this person and you stick things into it. And it's going to work even better if you get a piece of the person's hair. Magic really is, if anything, a more intuitive sense. Uh, it's almost a set of intuitive shortcuts for getting what it is that you want in the world. So it is not, it is, the, the, now the shortcuts don't work, 
but magic is not mystery. <laughs> quite, quite the contrary. Magic, you know, you had this way you have whole books. I mean, often magic was it's confused often with with the occult, um, which means hidden or mysterious. But that's not that that's not really what what magic was. And so when we are surrounded by things that are powerful and mysterious, that's not magic. That's just scary. <laughs> it's, I what, guess is what, is what I would say. What word would you have recommended Clark use instead of magic? Yeah, I, I think he knew what he meant. But he yeah, did. I do. I do know what he means. I think what he means is um, any sufficiently advanced technology would look like, I mean, this is awkward and, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't work as well, would, would look like the, the, the activity of a deity okay. is a better way to put that. Uh, um, okay. So you, so you, so, so it's, th that is to say, it is, it's not caused by humans, right? Any sufficiently advanced technology, people would look at it and they would say, well, I don't, this must be some kind of force that I don't understand. And to the extent that magic is actually a force that humans understood, that's, that's, it, it must have been something that came from a sort of being that has powers that we don't, that we don't know about. And you can call <laughs> that a deity, I guess. So any maybe maybe any technology sufficiently advanced technology looks divine. I don't know. I don't I don't know what the, the what the right thing would be, but that's th that that's what I would say. I mean, there's a, there's and, and there's something there too, right? Which is that magic is also a sign of our desire to be able to have fairly simple heuristics for figuring out what's going on in the world. Uh, in mm -hmm. that sense, the idea naturalness is in a way is magical. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a set of simple rules about reality um, that posits a, an order that governs everything. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if your interpretation of how our culture sees natural, you know, and and all the meaning there, does that involve any predictions that might either falsify or adjust your position? Uh, one thing that came to mind was. Um, the uh, term natural gas, you know, the uh, energy source, it has the word natural on it. Does that tap into that world that you've described? It's really interesting that you bring that up. So there's, a, there's actually a long history of people pushing to call it natural gas um, industry, uh, you know, for precisely the reason that it would soften um, the, the potential view of its harms. And there have been arguments recently, I think I read something in Mother Jones about, should we call it methane, right? Or should we, should we call natural gas something else okay. in order to get around that? So I have a, here's a prediction. I think that with energy, terms like wind and solar are currently obscuring potential environmental costs of these technologies. They did it for me, right? So it sounds as if these are natural forces, right? It's just the wind and the sun. Mm -hmm. And and that is, a, you know, obviously it's gonna be all, all benefit and no cost, but of course, solar panels are made out of materials that need to be mined and then they need to be thrown away when they no longer work. And I, that's a, this is not a, a ding on wind and solar, but I think, I, I think we're gonna find that some of the costs of renewable energy, especially when scaled, uh, whether that's the batteries that are involved or whatever it happens to be, that we're not, that people aren't thinking about those quite as much, certainly I haven't, simply because of the power of the words wind and solar. Mm -hmm. um, they just sound, they sound, sounds great, right? I just imagine the sun sort of beating down on things and making them work, um, which, which goes again to what I was saying before, which is that natural is a stand-in for epistemic transparency. When you, people say wind and solar, I feel like I understand how those things work. Whereas in fact, you know, I went to a solar farm in Japan, I guess it's an incredibly advanced technology. In fact, the, there could, there's nothing less natural than the technologies we're using to capture the energy of wind, uh, the wind and the sun, and that's that's not bad. That's good. But the illusion is that I that we understand how they work, when in fact we don't. You think solar, you know, you think wind energy, and maybe you imagine I don't know a windmill from 
Denmark or something, right? right? Which is, oh yes, well, I know how it works. It spins yes. and then there's it grinds the grain and I could make one of those with the right materials. Of course, it's nothing like that. Uh, right, and, and, and inevitability requires storage. So it, you, you'd have to have batteries, I, I believe, uh, maybe. Yes. I, so, um, and, and, and again, really those aren't clear. natural. That's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. and, and I am a, an enormous fan of renewable energy. I'm very concerned about global warming. I'd like to see us use less natural gas, more wind and solar. But I do think it's very important when we're figuring out what kind of energy we want, wh what are the costs going to be of this energy, that we are able to bracket the instinctive biases that are associated with nature and naturalness. And those come out a lot when people are thinking about something like wind and solar versus nuclear energy, which is a great example, which is the, the least natural thing. You got the fish with three eyes and the Simpsons, you've got Godzilla, which is this monster born of nuclear energy. And what are we doing? Well, we're messing with, you know, the, the most, it's like genetic engineering, right? The reason GMOs are taboo, I think, is the same reason that nuclear is taboo. It's not ultimately about, the, I mean, uh, nuclear has, uh, has a long history and there's, it gets very complicated, but I think a part of the taboo, at least, is that we're messing with, we're playing God, as something people say, right? And what do they mean by that? Well, they mean something like we're messing with nature in a way that we shouldn't. We're splitting the, the, the building blocks of nature, whether it's our genes or the atom. Mm -hmm. um, and that should be left only to nature or to God, which in a sense are, are, are one and the same. Whereas I don't care about that. I don't, there's no such thing as playing God. There's just doing stuff that's risky or not risky. And I wanna know if it's risky and what the costs and the benefits are, and then we can, we can go from there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's Regard, tough to do. Regarding uh, natural gas, uh, I did notice it's often promoted uh, you know, by energy companies as quote, clean natural gas. So they don't just say, natural gas, they prepend it with the word clean. So it seems like the promotional people, and I, I assume they're professionals, you know, the advertising agencies and so on, consultants figured out if we, that, that natural isn't good enough, they have to put clean in front of it. Well, uh, clean, clean's a very, you know, again, hammer nail, religion scholar, clean is one <laughs> step away from, clean is one step away from a cleanse um, and cleansing and purity are all very related. And it's not a coincidence that, of course, these are professionals, which is why clean meat was the term that people used uh, for a long time, and they're still using, to describe cell cultured meat uh, or artificial meat that's being grown rather than being taken from animals. So they understood quite well that they couldn't put natural in front the way the natural gas people could. It would be too obvious, right? You've got your steak is grown in a vat. You can't very well call it natural. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they do? They put clean in front. And that was a way of distracting from the unnaturalness of the process that, that led to the creation of the meat. And that word clean is another quasi-religious term that says to you, this is good in all possible ways. It is clean. What do they mean by clean? Well, in the clean meat case, they mean ethically clean. They mean clean in the sense that it is, it is free of, of, of impurities that might harm your health. Um, so it's a sort of holistic understanding of whatever the product happens to be. You know, with natural gas, they're lucky that they've got natural in there to do a lot of that work for them as well. Mm -hmm. One of our participants used to work at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, Charlene Deskins out in Atlanta, Maryland. Um, she notes uh, in terms of what we discussed earlier about, you know, FDA uh, labeling, uh, controlling what natural labeling would be. She talks about um, organic, so labeling something as organic, and she describes it as a marketing term to increase the amount farmers could sell their products for. Um, it, there's a distinction between labeling something natural and labeling something organic. Yep. Yeah, organic is regulated, um, and I was, as, as, as I'm sure she knows. Um, so that is, a, that is a regulated term. And it's interesting you say it's a marketing term that allows farmers to sell things at higher prices, which is true as far as I understand it. I'm not an agriculture expert, but um, Tamar Haspel who works at the Washington Post, has written extensive about this stuff, and I, I really trust her work. And one of the things she said that she likes about organic is precisely that it functions as a marketing term that allows farmers to sell their food for more because one of her big hobby horses is getting farmers to be paid more. Hmm. And so it's interesting that, you know, it's, well, hey, if we can get people to pay more for food, in other words, we can make farming more profitable for farmers, 
that's a good thing. Now it, it's, it's too bad that that needs to be through a kind of misconception about the relative healthfulness of your vegetables when they're organic. But, you know, again, this is a kind of complicated, it's a, we live in a complicated world. And I, I don't like that people would pay more for food because they thought it was healthier or safer when it wasn't. And that's, and again, it depends on the organic foods. Sometimes organic farming really is better for a particular environment or for soil. And sometimes it is not. And sometimes pesticides do harm workers and sometimes they don't. Um, I don't want people to be paying for something that they're not actually getting in their food. At the same time, I do want farmers to get paid more. <laughs> so maybe we need to figure out a better way to do that than, than selling people a story about the, the safety or healthfulness of their, of what, of their vegetables. Another of our participants, Richard Gross, uh, brings up the question of genetically modified organisms. Obviously, this is contrary to the natural um, the ethos that you've discussed, and yet there are undeniably good things, I think, to come out of GM uh, food technology. And uh, how, how would we accommodate that, uh, you know, in this... Um, philosophy that you've been describing of, of trying to add nuance, of trying to open minds to the crafted, as it were. Well, so to, so to do something that, uh, that's called, and I don't know who coined the term, but to steel man someone. So this is the opposite of a straw man. So the straw man, you create the worst possible version of your opponent's argument. To steel man someone is to create the best possible version of their argument. So I think that the steel man version of GMOs are bad because they aren't natural. It goes something like this. Yes, over time, humans have bred animals and they have created plants and, you know, we've done all kinds of stuff with, with breeding that, that means that we have, you know, in a sense, genetically modified organisms already. But the precautionary principle tells us that rapid technological change is a different sort of thing than change that happens slowly over time. So a lot of the stuff that we have around already is time tested. This is again, one of those values that goes along with the idea of naturalness. Whereas GMO technology is not time tested. And if invasive species or you know whatever other example you wanna give of sudden traumas to ecosystems are are, are to be taken as cautionary tales, then with GM foods and you know, crops and animals, perhaps it makes sense to be very careful introducing them and, and have a plan for doing it slowly over time with a, with, a, with a sense of humility. I think that's the steel man version of the anti-GMO because they're not natural argument. Now, I'm no expert on GMOs, but the, the people who are that I've spoken with tell me that actually this technology, we know enough about this technology to know that it is not a radical departure from things that we've been doing in the past, that in fact it is, allows very controlled changes to organisms um, that are very different from, for example, bombarding vegetables with radiation, creating a bunch of mutants and then picking the best one out and, and using that, which is how we have actually, there are many organic vegetables, many, I don't know, some organic vegetables that are commonly sold that were created in precisely that way by bombarding things with radiation. So the scientists have spoken with say, actually this, the idea that this is some sort of new technology that we don't understand at all is false. It, technology is not sui generis, genetically engineering, you know, organisms is, it grows out of other technologies that we understand very well. So this is not some kind of new crazy thing that we're introducing to the world um, in the way that, I don't know, the internet was, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and that certainly had all kinds of consequences that we, that we couldn't predict. So that's, you know, to the extent that writing this book just impressed me with how little I know and how complicated the world is, I'd want to have very smart people who have thought hard about that precautionary principle, sitting down with very smart people who think that precautionary principle is garbage when it comes to GMOs. And I'd like to see them talking with each other. And I'd like to see our regulatory scheme come out of the conversations that they have. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, it seems to me a good way to move forward. Always, of course, with a copy of my book at their side to <laughs> remind them that 
we should never assume that what is natural is good, that whatever conversation we're having should bracket that assumption. Yes, um, one of our uh, questions, comments here um, from Susan Madison is, uh, you know, obviously we're so aware of um, human's disruption of nature's equilibrium, such as it is, obviously it's complicated. Um, there are cases where um, human action will protect nature. I, I mentioned one at the beginning, you know, human technology to deflect an asteroid that would devastate Earth's ecosystem. Um, it, I, I guess that's an extremely dramatic example, but it shows how humanity, you know, can craft, again, I'm trying to push that word there, I guess, um, you know, a, nat a natural um, condition uh, that we find, you know, a beautiful or otherwise worth maintaining, conserving, you mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation here. But what are your thoughts about that as us as stewards of earth, stewards of nature? Well, Stuart, Stuart Brand, who founded the Whole Earth Catalog, said something I'm paraphrasing him here. You know, we have become as gods, so we might as well get good at it, uh, something like that. Um, so whether or not we want to be engineering or crafting the earth, that's what we're doing. We're crafting it. That's, there's no getting around it. There is, in a sense, no, you know, on my natural, unnatural continuum, if natural means will, or if unnatural means willed by humans, then there's nothing on earth that is completely natural. Um, everything has been touched by our will in one way or another, um, the, given that the climate is something that has been touched by our will. So we're going to have to be crafting natural systems. We're just, we're in the business of it now, whether we like it or not. That said, there is, you know, natural systems do have a kind of, I mean, homeostasis is a tough word. There were, you know, the, the, the idea of climax, climax states in forests has now been challenged by modern forest, you know, modern research on how forest systems work. So it's not like we reach this point of stability and everything's hunky dory until someone messes with it. But you can look at a natural system, let's say the human body, and there's obviously things that disrupt that system in bad traumatic ways. If someone takes my heart out of my body, it's not going to work very well. If someone raises the temperature of, of the environment that I'm in, 500 degrees, I, my body is not going to do well. And we can therefore look to and respect the complexity of natural systems and the way in which they maintain a kind of cohesive order when we go about doing the crafting that we have to do. So that's again, I guess, a call for humility and a call for educating ourselves about the complexity of natural systems while also discouraging a sort of naive, let's just keep nature as it is approach that is inadvisable and even if it were, wouldn't, wouldn't be possible anyway. Mm -hmm. It seems to me our distant descendants will need to deal with ice ages on Earth. We know that those happen, you know, it's, it's an orbital effect as uh, Earth's orbit changes around the sun. There are, I, I don't remember what the cycle is. I should have done my homework before this, but, you know, it's happening live. But uh, you can Google uh, that to learn more. Um, starts with an M, the person's name. Uh, what that cycle is, um, and uh, that, uh, you know, what, what will our um, descendants do about that, I wonder? Uh, should we try to uh, minimize ice ages in the future? Obviously, we've learned how to turn the thermostat up uh, clumsily, but I, I wonder what the morality of that will be, you know, many thousands of years from now. Well, certainly, but certainly, I think whatever we're going to be doing, it's going to be anthropocentric. Yes. Um, you know, that's that. And that's one of the things, again, about the idea that nature is good, that, that I think is important to keep in mind, that when we talk about conserving nature, that kind of thing, we're doing it with our own interests in, in, in mind. Um, you know, you heat up the climate. Once humans are gone, you know, the, the rest of nature will be fine. Two million years from now, you know, all kinds of all kinds of things will thrive and flourish. Even the melting, you know, the, there's Antarctic moss that is delighted to have uh, temperatures rising. It is flourishing down there. Um, you know, ultimately, 
we're concerned about our place in these shifting systems. And there's something I think a little disingenuous about, you know, the, the sixth extinction or whatever it happens to be. It's also a sort of religiosity, I think. This idea that, that it, what we're doing must be bad in all possible ways, that we're bad, it's bad for biodiversity, it's bad for the oceans, that there's some kind of system that is either getting better or getting worse, which is, which is not the case. There are, it's a very complicated set of systems and the better or worse that we impose on it is not out there, it is in here. Even the idea of biodiversity, which is, which is a word that you hear a lot these days, you don't want a desert to be biodiverse. In fact, again, to take Antarctica, which is a part of my research for a current project, fascinating place. In Antarctica, they're desperate to reduce biodiversity um, in order to keep things natural. So it's humans that are bringing in all of the new organisms. And I remember I was talking to a researcher at one of the stations who was saying to me, there's this one plant and they don't know whether it was brought there naturally, that is by a bird that brought it in um, uh, on their, you know, on their foot or something, you know, it's stuck to some soil or by humans. And so there's this big debate about what to do with this plant. Do they get rid of it because it's, uh, because it's humans adding biodiversity or do they keep it because it's animals adding biodiversity? So it's, a, it's sort of a, a funny ethical puzzle. And I, you know, figuring out what to do with that plant in a way is, is a riddle that has to do with figuring out our place in the natural order of things, which again is a phrase that I think makes a lot of sense as long as you don't assume that that order is therefore good. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our participants uh, found the word I was trying to think of, by the way, Milankovitch, as far as the cycles of uh, Earth's ice age uh, as, as a result mm -hmm. of orbital changes uh, around the sun. Um, a sort of a big picture observation uh, I had after reading your book, watching your interviews, it, it's pretty clear that you want to make a distinction between the worship of nature, which you think is unwise, and the love of nature. You think that's a positive, that that's, that's how you'd like humanity to head towards. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. So I, th this, again, a takeaway from the book, people can take away one thing that's fine to love nature. It's good to love, I mean, I, I don't know, it's good. I, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to love nature without worshiping it. And I would say the same for a lot of the values that we hold. Um, uh, aesthetic beauty is a wonderful thing to love, mm -hmm. but that is not the value out of which all other values emerge. Freedom yes. is a wonderful thing and we should cherish it and love it, but it is, it exists in tension with other things that we value, like loving nature, for example, or mm -hmm. wanting to you know, respect the rights of our fellow human beings. And love of nature is one among many often conflicting values that belong, I believe, among those values. And that was a change that happened to me. Well, it wasn't really a change. It was that I realized that I loved nature, I guess. And so I had to, and everyone loves nature. Uh, I haven't met a person yet who doesn't love nature in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's fine. As long as we allow that that love of nature coexists alongside other values that often aren't compatible with it. I mean, a really good example of this, I didn't get to talk about in the book that much, if it, actually at all, I don't think is um, accessibility in national parks. So national parks, especially in the United States, are, are meant to be places that are as close to nature as possible, which again, according to my, my definition is, that is to say there, there, there's, there's a minimal presence of human will in these places. Mm -hmm. But we also want people to be able to access these natural places. And if you want people in wheelchairs to be able to access Yellowstone Park, that means building unnatural paths for them to be able to go on. And it's not even just people with disabilities who we want to be able to access these areas, you know, even just having roads so that people can visit them means that there's a compromise a built into the love of nature, which is that to love nature is, 
in part to want to experience it, but the experience of nature by definition is going to require some interference with the thing that it is that we are trying to experience. And so there's a paradox, there's a paradox built into it right there. And we need to, you know, exhort people to embrace that paradox as inevitable and something to grapple with rather than something that we can paper over or ignore. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like maybe parts of the parks would be accessible and other parts would be where people that don't need help would enjoy as much of the park as possible. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. I, I mean, it's always there's always a, there's always a compromise and there's currently I mean, there's work being done right now um, by people with disabilities about how to make parks more accessible without with with a minimal amount of of human, you know, of a human presence or will. Um, and that's all fine. I mean, I think you know we need to discuss these things and figure mm-hmm. out figure out exactly how we want to do them, always without the kind of instinct to homogeneity and purity um, that that I often see associated with nature and naturalness. And you know, obviously, I you know I keep saying this is a secular version of a religious phenomenon, but as you know from reading the book, often the two coexist. So in you know, Catholic teachings about contraception, for example, the idea of natural order is brought up over and over and over again. So religions have very much seen in the natural order as created by God, a place that is a source of norms about how we ought to behave and how and what kinds of things are permissible and what kinds of things aren't permissible. So I don't want it, I don't want this to seem like it's either religious or it's natural, since for since in many cases the two have been convertible in very interesting ways. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, on the discussion of you know changing us from worshiping nature to loving nature, I, I might answer. What can't both be blind, blind worship and blind love? What, what would you think about that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what, I mean, I guess when I hear blind, I, that's, that's a word that often people associate with faith. Um, you know, people, you know, my, my father's an ardent atheist, right? It's a blind faith. Why do people have blind faith? Um, I, I, I don't, when I say worship, I don't mean this is something that people are doing unthinkingly. What I mean by worship is that they think about naturalness as the underlying condition for and source of all goodness. <laughs> um, and, and that is what I don't want people to do. To, to love something, on the other hand, I think is to recognize that the thing that you love is not the underlying condition for and source of all good things in the world. You know, I love my I love my wife, but she is not she is not the one who decides what's right and wrong in the world. Um, and then that's in that's the room there with you. Uh, she absolutely she uh, she does decide. It turns out what is right and wrong in the world. And <laughs> she's, not, she's not she's not here. Um, but that's so that's what I mean. What I mean is that is that. The worship assumes a particular kind of originating normative force that love does not. In both cases, I would say let's not be blind about things. But um, you know, that's that that that's what I mean by the distinction between worship and love. Mm-hmm. What are your views on religious naturalism? For instance, biologist Ursula Goodenough wrote uh, this is in the late '90s. The sacred depths of nature. What what are your views on that? Well, there's a lot. There's a long history of looking for the sacred in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, the the whole, you know, holy earth by L. H. Bailey was this book that was very popular. Um, sort of like a you know, quasi. It was actually a very interesting, sort of libertarian take on nature. Um, but I, I, the the idea of religious naturalism. I, I find often is split, it's, it, it can be thought of in two different ways. On the one hand, these are people who find in nature a, sor- a source of profound meaning and connection with what is valuable in the world. And in, in that way, I don't think there's anything wrong with religious naturalism. Um, you, if you find nature for you, if for you, nature is the place where you feel 
most meaning and existentially fulfilled, if that's what nature is, and that's where you find existential fulfillment, that's wonderful. Um, and, and, and sacred is a great word to be used for that, right? Nature is a sacred place for you. Um, again, provided that you're not worshiping it. In other words, it's one thing to find existential fulfillment in nature, and it's quite another to say, and therefore we should deduce all of our norms from nature. That's just a different kind of thing. Uh, and there are plenty of people who worship nature but don't find that sort of aren't, aren't, aren't in the sense that you were describing, you know, religious naturalism is not religious naturalism in the sense that nature is not the thing necessarily that gives them existential meaning in this way. <laughs> so I'd want to separate those two things. One is using nature or naturalness as a, as a source, as the source of norms. And the other is finding in nature a source of meaning or existential fulfillment. And that that's fine. I think that's that's great. Who am I to tell people how to how to find fulfillment? Um, and you know, nature seems like a great place to 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 feel connected to forces beyond and before yourself. Mm -hmm. so it's humbling, you know. Indeed, I um one uh, question I had when I uh, had read your book was uh, you describing you know human experiences of um, natural and unnatural or and, and you know, this, this entire topic we're discussing. Uh, and I wonder if animals might have that same type of uh, behavior uh, or perspective. And one example, and, you know, feel free to laugh, but uh, here it is. Uh, if, if you give a dog a bath and the dog runs away, it gets outside and rolls in the mud or dirt. Um, it, it's responding to something it doesn't like about itself, and then it takes an action to change that. Of course, we don't have uh, uh, experts uh, on, um, you know, animal behavior. Perhaps this is absurd, but uh, what, what do you think of that? Well, it's interesting you bring up dogs and cats, creatures that, or you brought up dogs, but uh, I'm thinking now immediately of cats as well, because I'm, I'm a cat person. Dogs are uh, subservient and inferior to cats. Sorry uh -oh. for all of your, sorry for all of your I, listeners that don't realize. The show now. Uh -oh, yeah. uh -oh, I'm out of here yeah. now. So <laughs> with dogs, with dogs and cats, you know, uh, creatures that wouldn't exist without human beings, of course, they're the, they're the most unnatural of creatures. Um, I, you often see people, so I, cats, I know more about cats than dogs, but, um, so cats, often you'll see people using the same sort of appeal to nature to explain problems with cats. Um, so they say, oh, if your cat is sick, it's because it's not eating the food that nature intended it to eat. You see natural cat foods um, and natural dog foods. If you go in, you see all, all kinds of appeals to nature for how you should take care of your pets. Um, and yet, if you let your cats be outside and roam around naturally, they, they kill, I, I want to say, billions of birds? I mean, it seems like a number is too high, but uh, I know that whenever I see the number, I'm always shocked. And squirrels, yes. Um, you know, they are bad for other parts of nature. And so, and in cats also, domestic animals, it's like animals in zoos, their quality of life in captivity really varies. Some animals do better in zoos, some animals do worse. Mm -hmm. um, and the lesson for me there is, again, Naturalness is a great hypothesis generating heuristic. Um, are, is, in, is an animal in a zoo not thriving? Perhaps it's because it's, the environment is not as close to its natural environment or because captivity is bad for it. But it is, I don't think that animals like or dislike things because they are natural. Hmm. I think animals like or dislike things because they like or dislike things in the same way that humans like or dislike things because they like or dislike things. And a way of thinking about this that's helpful to me is that we never credit unnatural things for, we, we never use unnaturalness as a, as a reason for why something is good. So sometimes people say, oh, this food, this food is good for you because it's natural. Whereas no one would ever say this computer is good because it is unnatural. That's as we would, you would never say that. Instead you would say why the computer is good. It's useful for doing this kind of thing and transferring information. Um, so I, I really think that natural and unnatural both as sort of primary reasons for why something is good or bad or why an animal likes or doesn't like something don't, don't really make a lot of sense. An animal likes or doesn't like something or something is good or bad because of its ability to do or not do something. And the animal likes or dislikes something because of 
you know, whatever set of factors it is that causes the dog to roll around in the mud. But I don't think naturalness is a is an endpoint for any explanation. No, I, I think you're right as, as you're describing this. It occurs to me a strong perfume. You know, at ten, ten, if if there were no scent to it, perhaps that would be an interesting experiment to see if giving a dog a bath that didn't have that strong, you know, pleasant to humans, but perhaps overwhelming a dog's sensitive sense of smell. Um, you know, well, certainly. Could... And certainly if you want to keep your dog from running outside after the bath, all you have to do is, is spread some human manufactured dog treats uh, all over the house <laughs> and they will, they will be happy to stay inside sure. in your temperature control. <laughs> Well, way, that's another thing too, right? Anim you know, animals want to stay inside the temperature control of the home just as much as the humans do, at least the domestic ones. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned zoos a minute ago. And, uh, you know, my, my hope is that uh, someday there won't be zoos and they'll be replaced with, you know, uh, GoPros or the equivalent in the future, cameras out in the wild, maybe robots that move among the animals without alarming them. And then we can watch the animals go about their lives in their natural environments. It seems to me like that's that's a big improvement of, of over watching, you know, something in a cage or the equivalent of a cage. We want to smell them or other senses. Oh, I gosh, see, that's this is actually a great place where I would tell you, you know, this is where I value what's natural. I think the animal live, like in person, um, is more natural than the video of the animal and that there's mm -hmm. so there would be a tremendous loss if we never got to see the actual animal. Now, to the extent that zoos, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm no expert on, on animal welfare. So I, but I think that zoos are getting better. <laughs> and certainly um, the environment that animals are in, in zoos, people are really trying to increase. So maybe there's some animals that don't, that, that just suffer a lot in yeah. zoos. But to the extent that seeing an animal in person is, is to me a fundamentally different experience than seeing a video of an animal. As much as I like David Attenborough's documentaries for the BBC, and they're truly incredible, especially with the camera work that we can do these days, it's a different kind of thing. And, and I, for one, I would regret the loss of, 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 the, of the natural animal in the unnatural environment, mm -hmm. um, that is, to, which is the zoo. Listen, I don't want to uh, burn out your time here. I, I definitely want to spend some social time with our members. Um, how, how are you holding up? Do you think if we oh, go a little longer? I'm, sure, absolutely. I got, I got, I mean, I haven't checked it yet. Let me check the time. Oh yeah, yeah well, it looks like, yeah, we could, get, let's take a couple more minutes and then go to the social hour. Um, Cause it'd be nice to have that, that smaller, more intimate chat as well. Sounds good. Um, I'll, um, Definitely want to ask you this before we go. Um, you, you have something, one of your chapters about hospitals and, you know, dealing with rituals uh, of, of, you know, um, end of life and so on. And you mentioned that about 100 years ago, uh, hospitals stopped putting gardens in and plants. Yeah. And it does, it does seem to me like you, you want to avoid risking, uh, you know, contaminating uh, the environment with allergenic, um, you know, biological material, you know, pollen or whatever. Yep. Um, and so, so it, there's but, some uh, solutions to that that people are working on. So one of them, as I, I mentioned briefly in the book, is hospital gardens, right? So having areas where patients can go and experience something natural. So you could, you know, if you can get up from your hospital bed, um, but you need to be in the hospital. You can at least visit an area. And this was something that was very common um, and is becoming. There are actually hospital architects that are that are trying to integrate these sort of things. The other thing is you get hypoallergenic plants. Um, there are ways to get around these problems. Dentists, at least the ones I've been to, have figured out that just putting pictures of nature on the on the ceiling that you can look at while you're getting your teeth worked on. Uh, are, are nice. Um, yeah. so, so, you know, at, at the very least, we could get away from the clinical stainless steel and white walls um, towards something that's a little bit more, if you'll forgive the word, natural. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sick, what you want, what a lot of people want is to feel connected with life. Yes. And life, understandably, is something we associate with nature. Yeah. Um you know, my, my mother was in hospice in her final days. And, uh, you know, 
We had music that we knew she liked playing softly, but also nature sounds overnight, uh, the yeah. sounds of ocean waves. And then at, as the sun is coming up, you'd have uh, bird songs and other um, pleasant nature sounds uh, in that uh, situation. Uh, about hospitals, you know, you, you're uh, antiseptic, uh, you know, metal and bright white and fluorescent lamps and so on. I do want to put in a comment of my own here, and that is I think someday our technology of living spaces, you know, our homes, our workplaces, now one and the same in many cases, but are, you know, boxes with holes in them for windows, for doors, and we have some ventilation, we have some lighting, but I think that technology will improve, and I think, I hope that it will be in hospitals as well, where the air is fresh, even though it's safe and the lighting is beautiful. And um, I think actually some of this technology will come from trying to live on other worlds, on the moon, eventually Mars, um, and, and in hostile places on earth, uh, you know, the South Pole stations and so on. Um, you know, we, we can do better than we do now. The, the art and science of living spaces is going to make a change that I think we may not fully grasp right now. And I'm, I'm not talking about like a Star Trek holodeck where we're surrounded by an illusion or something, but genuinely good lighting, genuinely good uh, fresh air. And it'll feel like it's a nice day indoors anytime you want, which is always, I would assume. Yes. But I, I throw that out for your consideration and our, our participants here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Um, should I? Oh, I got to mention this. You're in Charlottesville um, and we're talking about nature. You are going to experience a wonder of nature in a couple of months. Do you know what I'm talking about? You mean the cicadas? Indeed, I do. The 17th. Yeah. And, and this will be your first encounter, I assume. Um, With the cicadas in Charlottesville, you mean? I mean yeah. Well, uh, Brew yeah. 10, Brew 10 is like nothing you'll ever experience until 17 years from now. And yeah, I don't think you were, you were in the eastern air uh, part of the country here in 2004. Um, I was not. No. So there's I mean, one of the things for me, Cicada is one of the fascinating things that is very related to the sort of quasi divination or div divinization of, of, of nature is with the prime number, I mean, I don't know how familiar you or your listeners are with the way in which cicadas emerge, but they emerge um, uh, uh, using a uh, prime number intervals of years. Yes. And there are, there's actually a whole branch of philosophy of science that deals with the uncanny effectiveness of mathematics for describing the natural world. And there is a way in which the the, the descriptive force of mathematics or the descriptive power of mathematics when it comes to the natural world lends a sense, not of design exactly, but a sense that there is some kind of cosmic order that transcends humans. That's just, you know, you see it, you know, if it's in the math and if it's in the cicadas and if it's in you know, what, what, the, the, the fractal patterns in ferns, um, that also can feed into the idea that the order of nature is therefore the source from which we should take the order of our own culture and our own lives. Um, and I feel that power myself. There's something mystical about, you know, why, why prime numbers? And of course, people have talked about this and, and, and come up with some sort of evolutionary theories. But nevertheless, the, the uncanny power of mathematics to describe the natural world <laughs> is a, a source of the sort of reverence for natural order um, that we see in appeals to nature. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about prime numbers, obviously 17. There are also other species that are 13. Right. Exactly. Interestingly, as far as I know, there are no 11 years. So there's a prime number that nature turned its nose or antennas or whatever up at. And I, I don't know offhand why 11 got, you know, thrown out. Maybe it's too short and predators were syncing up on 11 year cycle. Right. They, they gave up at 
maybe 13 is unlucky for insects or something. I don't know, uh, for, for predators. Um, listen, um, I think um, maybe we'll wrap up here. I, I still have other questions. I know for a fact other NCAST members have questions because I haven't gotten to all of them and I apologize, <laughs> but hopefully we'll all be together and you'll see faces and we'll be smiling. And um, I know that because I've seen a lot of compliments posted here about what Oh, you're good. I, I'm really great. I'm grateful uh, for everyone. You know, I, I can't see any of you. So to all of you out there, I'm just really grateful. Um, you know, uh, as an author, it sounds like a cliche, but it's, it's always humbling. To, and to have people interested in what it is that you've written and what you think about. And I'm, I'm very grateful to, to have been here and, and to have had all of you as, as an audience. I really, really appreciate that. Please hang on and uh, we'll get that started in just a minute. I do want to reassure our non-NCAST members because we have a lot of people, you know, Philadelphia and other places that have been participating, uh, but they're not NCAST members. Um, if you post your question here in the chat window, I will absolutely put that out there for Dr. Levinovitz and I'll do my best to be a secretary and post those answers right back in. So uh, you know, we're, we're here to get information moved around and, 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 and you know, enlighten everybody. And uh, I, I wanna make sure I, I fulfill my role in that. Um, let's see, I'll uh, do some closing remarks here and then we'll start the reception, all right? So I wanna thank you, Dr. Levinovitz and everybody who participated today. And uh, uh, please join us again next month, Saturday, April 10th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Our speaker will be Christopher French. He's Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Goldsmiths, University of London. 20 years ago, he founded the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit, where they research psychological explanations for experiences that people typically label as paranormal. So that's April 10th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Today's program was produced by J.D. Mack. Thanks, J.D. And again, I want to uh, let our NCAS members know, check your email inboxes in like two minutes. Join us on Zoom for an exclusive online reception with Dr. Levinovitz starting in just a few minutes. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.